let's talk about some fundamentals of gas engines so that we can all kind of start from uh, the same base. Now, uh, gas engines, how are they different to other engines? Uh, fundamentally, they're not really. It's, it's about the fuel that's used to power them. So if you've looked at uh, a gas engine on the inside, they look much the same as any other engine. And in fact, from the outside, they also look much the same as any other engine. So I've got up here, one of these is a diesel and the other one is a gas engine. You'd be hard pressed to tell the difference. Uh, you know, Caterpillar, for example, uh, one of the most popular engines on the market is the Caterpillar 3516. Well, there is a 3516 and a 3516G, right? The G is the only thing that really denotes the fact that it is a gas engine. They're both based on the same architecture and a lot of the same technology. Now, when you get to the, the top end, of course, things have changed. Gas engines tend to be spark ignited versus compression ignited, but fundamentally they are almost the same engine, right? They're packaged in almost the same way and they can be used in the same way, right? Like in a lot of cases, the, the 3516 series is used for power generation, both as a diesel engine and as a gas engine. So there's not that many differences between a, a gas engine versus any other kind of engine versus um, you know, the actual fuel that's being used. Now, the fuel that's being used, this is, of course, a combustion engine. So we are taking some kind of carbon-based fuel and we're igniting it. Now, we can talk a little bit about some of the more exotic fuels that are being talked about, like hydrogen and ammonia. But at the moment, we're going to speak specifically about the actual gases. All right. So what we're doing is we're taking fuel, we're adding oxygen, and what we get is energy plus exhaust, right? This is the fundamental equation which underpins all combustion engines. But instead of using uh, fuel like petrol, no, instead we're using a, a gas, right? Which is predominantly composed of methane in the case of natural gas, um, but it might have some contaminants and it might have some heavier molecules like propane and butane in it as well. All right, now at a very basic level, when we burn methane, we are combining methane and oxygen, and what we get is energy, carbon dioxide, and water. Now that's for a perfect burn, right? In which every single molecule of methane is consumed, it's matched with an uh, adjoining oxygen molecule and you get perfect combustion into carbon dioxide and water. Now, of course, in practice, this doesn't actually happen. Now, one of the things that's really interesting is that when you look across the different flame temperatures, right, for different fuels, what you'll see is a very big difference between gasoline and methane. Now, gasoline and diesel, they sort of burn in the same ballpark. So this comparison holds true for the difference between gas and diesel as well. So what you'll see is that, you know, gasoline engines tend to burn, let's say a flame temperature of a little bit above 1000 degrees Celsius. And for methane, it's in that ballpark of about 1600. Now that's a pretty big difference, right? In Celsius, it's a difference of 50%. I get that's not an absolute scale. If you want a true percentage difference, you have to take it relative to absolute zero. So let's say that the difference is, you know, 35% or in that ballpark. It's still a significant difference in temperature, and that's one of the huge drivers be behind why we need specialized engine oils for gas applications. It's, it's largely down to the temperature difference. All right, now let's, let's talk a little bit about the technologies that are employed in gas engines. So you can sort of split up the technologies into these three different groups. You've got two versus four stroke, you have turbocharged versus naturally aspirated, and we have a lean burn versus stoichiometric. Now I get on that third row, there should technically be three options, lean burn, stoichiometric, and rich burn. But in practice, we don't really see that many rich burn engines. All right, so let's talk about the number of strokes. Most of the engines that you're gonna see are four stroke engines, right? So the, the way that they operate is much like any other four stroke engine, right? That you would have in a, in a petrol or a diesel um, car. Okay, four stroke engine, far and away, um, kind of like, the, the most common, let's put it that way. Now, there are two stroke uh, gas engines. What is unique about the gas engine market is that, um, let's say for example, in day-to-day -day use, we typically associate two stroke engines with very, very small niche applications. Things like my lawnmower, right, is a, is a two stroke engine, or some dirt bikes, for example, are two stroke, or, um, yeah, I mean, like that's a lot, or, or boating, right? Uh, there's a lot of two-stroke two stroke motors as well. They tend to be small, compact, very simple engines, right? So we're, we're talking about a lot of like household appliances where you, um, where really anyone can, can kind of maintain and work on them. 
That's not the case when it comes to gas engines. The two strokes tend to be much, much larger than their four stroke counterparts. So the, if you've ever seen like a Cooper Bessemer style engine, these are the ones that are absolutely huge. They're, they're gigantic engines. Um, so there are a lot of two stroke uh, gas engines out there. They're just not as, as common as the four stroke variety. Okay, then we also have to go into the difference between uh, turbocharged and nas naturally aspirated. Now again here, turbocharged engines are far more common than naturally aspirated. So why would that be the case? Well, going back to our, our equation, we had methane plus oxygen gives energy, carbon dioxide, and water. Well, to balance that equation out, we actually need two oxygens and two waters. And this is an equation which we would call stoichiometric. Now that's a fancy word that basically means everything is perfectly balanced. Thanos would approve. So what we're basically saying is that there are exactly the correct number of molecules on the left-hand side of the equation to make exactly the correct number of molecules on the right-hand side of the equation. So if in, in somehow I were to create an engine which had one methane molecule in it and two oxygen molecules in it, then when I burnt them, because they're all in contact with each other, I get one carbon dioxide and two waters. And then I could multiply that by an integer number. So let's say, for example, I could have four methanes and eight oxygens would give me energy plus four carbon dioxides and eight waters. Now, this is what we call stoichiometric. The thing is, though, we, we're not putting oxygen into our engine. We're putting air into our engine. And air is, of course, a mixture of all kinds of different gases. It's predominantly nitrogen. Then we have a bit of oxygen as well as argon, carbon dioxide, and a whole bunch of other gases, right? Now, how much of air is oxygen? It's about 20%. I think it's actually like 19.6 or something like that. But it, for our purposes, let's say it's about 20%. So in order to react methane with two molecules of oxygen, right, what we actually need is about 10 molecules of air, right? We say in, in that ballpark, right? When I say molecules of air, that doesn't really make sense, does it? So it's like 10 units of air. I'm, I'm picking an arbitrary number here. And the reason I say that is because about 20% of air is oxygen. Now, when we actually do the calculations, right, because air is made up of molecules of all sorts of different sizes, what you actually get is a ratio of air to fuel, which is 16.09. So this is, would be an air fuel ratio, which is perfectly stoichiometric. In that ratio, there is the exactly correct amount of oxygen to perfectly react with the methane. Now, how does that affect combustion? All right, when we look at it on, uh, on a graph, basically what happens is if we've got the air fuel ratio is on the, on the x-axis, then at some point at 16.09, we call that stoichiometric. Now, if we are to the left of the curve, you'll see what happens as we increase the air to fuel ratio we get a dramatic decrease in the amount of carbon monoxide in the exhaust, right? So remember, if we're not getting perfectly stoichiometric combustion, then we have all kinds of other weird things that happen in the exhaust. A similar thing happens with NOx, right? So we have very little NOx production, and then near stoichiometric, we have a lot of NOx production, which we don't like. And then as we increase the air fuel ratio, that NOx production decreases again. Similar thing goes on with oxygen, right? Where the amount of oxygen is very low initially, but as we increase the air fuel ratio, that means that there is more oxygen than is, is needed for combustion, which means that we're gonna have oxygen in the products, right? So if I am on the left side of this, this is what is called rich burn. So I have more fuel than I need. So generally what we get is more power. On the right hand side, this is called lean burn, and it generally results in fewer emissions, right? So if I have oxygen in the exhaust, I don't really care, although it's a bit of a waste. But if I have less carbon monoxide and less no uh, NOx emissions, then that's favorable, right? So we tend to have, because of emissions regulations, lean burn engines. That's why they tend to be uh, the, the most popular. Now, one of the things is that in an effort to reduce emissions to their greatest extent, we have gone with very, very lean burn engines with very high air to fuel ratios. And the problem with that is that in some cases, it's so lean that the spark can't actually ignite that air and fuel mixture. So a lot of the time, what you'll see is designs where they have 
um, what's called a pre-combustion chamber. So there's a little chamber up above where it has a bit of a mix uh, with a rich, uh, it's a rich burn environment. Now what that'll enable is the spark to then propagate a flame. And once that flame is at a higher temperature, it will then burn the lean mixture. So we kind of get the best of both worlds. All right, so that is why in the vast majority of gas engines that you will see today, most of them are four stroke, turbocharged, lean burn engines. If you found this content useful, head on over to lubrication.expert. It's a website where there's tons more training courses, they're more structured, and it's available for about 22 US dollars a month.